Hey, it's Greg Stanley. Do you know you can now win prizes such as a Starbucks gift card, Concord tickets, or car swag for being the first to answer an entertaining trivia question? Get the weekly trivia question by following me on Instagram or Facebook at The Collector Car Podcast and just DM me your answer. The first person with the correct answer wins. Also, as a new aspect of my automotive passion and hobby, I am a car specialist consultant for RM Sotheby's. If you need assistance consigning a collector car at Amelia Island, Pebble Beach, Auburn, West Palm, or Hershey, email me directly at gstanley at rmsotheby's.com. This is the Collector Car Podcast, the home for the auto enthusiast. Join Greg Stanley as he applies over 25 years of insights and analytical experience to the collector car market. He will interview the experts and throw in some fun stuff as well. Hey, it's Greg Stanley. I'm just going to do a quick recap of the Amelia Island Concourse de Elegance. Just for a little bit behind the scenes of what I was up to, I actually traveled down to Florida on Thursday. And then Friday, I drove over to Orlando. I was speaking at a PodFest Expo. I had to get up like at 5.30 in the morning to get there in time. And that was pretty cool because that was for my other podcast called Learn From Others, in which I share career journeys of successful individuals for to students. So students can learn a lot of different types of careers they might not be aware of in preparation for their future career life. Uh, and then after the podcast festival, it's actually through Sunday, but I was just there Friday. I drove up to Jacksonville, and on my way in Daytona, I test drove a 1967 Camaro for a friend. It was a cool Camaro, but it had some issues, was a paint change, wasn't as advertised, so I had to pass on that car. And then Friday night, I attended RM Sotheby's auction, which was very lively and active, so there was no sign of the coronavirus impacting things at all. When I walked in, they were auctioning off the Ferrari Enzo, which I believe was a high sale of the auction, which I'll go to in a second. If you hear some background noise, that is our kitty cat, uh, Piper, that was missing us tremendously while we were gone for four days. Uh, I met some cool folks that uh, I had not met before, some of the guys from Legendary Motor Cars. They have the TV show on, I think it's Motor Trend. He said they're not being played in the U.S. right now. Hopefully it'll be soon, uh, but you can catch them when you're up in Canada. Now, my cat is trying to walk across the keyboard, which I'm not going to let her do that. Uh, let's see, what else? So, Saturday, got an early start at Cars and Coffee. This is the first time I actually went to Cars and Coffee. And it was a massive event. I walked in, and the first thing I saw there was the Viper Club. Super nice folks. Hope to have them on in the future, talking about all things Viper-related. Out front of the Ritz-Carlton, which is the main hub of everything around Amelia Allen Concourse Elegance Weekend, there are these crazy Apollos. They're called Apollo IEs, which stands for Intensa Emotion. Or I'm going to get that wrong. Actually, I already got that wrong. So Intense Emotion is what it stands for. And the coolest one was a De, to De Tomaso that was sitting out there trying to bring back the Pantera name. And it was gorgeous. It was a light blue. It had a glass canopy with white stitched interior. I don't know how comfortable that would be because there was no like roof per se. It was all a glass canopy. But it was absolutely gorgeous. The pretty, prettiest car out there. And you can check the links to all these on my blog when it's posted at the collectorcarpodcast.com. Other notable cars that were on the show field for Saturday and on Sunday. They had the new Lotus that um, was really wild and cool on a stand there with a couple other cars. The Mercedes Maybach SUV was there. I did not get a chance to check that out. McLaren had a race car on their stand. Uh, Corvette had a nice display with an orange C8 and a race car as well. And the Revology folks right out front had a couple Shelbys. So these were 1967 Shelby's, I think they, I can't remember what the second one was, but they had modern uh, 4.6 liter engines, modern drivetrain. I'm assuming the sticker is around 200 to 250. I didn't get a chance to see, but hopefully they will be future guests on the podcast as well. So now we're going to cover a few things from all the auctions that occurred. Uh, Gooding and Bonhams occurred prior on Thursday and Friday. Uh, so a few facts about the auction. This shows you that there really was not an effect from the coronavirus. Uh, comparing 2020 to 2019, so gross sales were up by two million. The number of cars not sold was down, went from 51 last year to 40 this year. Total number of cars was up, so there's 351 this year versus 338 last year. So more cars were there, less cars did not sell, and the total number of cars sold was up from uh, 287 to 311. So the average price of cars sold was down slightly, 
uh, from $264,000 last year to an average of $250,000 this year. And the average year of the car, which was a, this was interesting, this is all from K500. The average year of the car was up from 1965 to 1966. So the average age is going up. It didn't go up tremendously, just one year, but it's interesting to see that tracked. The percent of cars not sold, I'm sorry, the percent of cars sold at no reserve was up from 62% to 66%. And let's go by auction house. Bottoms had the most cars not sold with 26 of 36, and the average price of those cars was $183,000. Average price of the cars sold was $183,000. The average year of the cars offered at Bonhams was 1953, so they specialize in much older cars, which is actually three years newer than the previous year. Last year was 1950 was the average age of the cars, and they only sold 77.5% of their cars. Gooding was second with six cars not sold, and an average price of the sold cars is $250,000. The average year of cars offered, this is interesting, was 1984, believe it or not. So they had a lot more of the new cars, this is where a lot of the BMWs we spoke about from two podcasts ago with Eric Keller, where they were sold, which drove this number up. And that was up from the average year uh, two years ago was 1979. So they went up five years in age on the average car. They sold 92.5% of their cars. And I'm not going to review all of them, but just to review some of the cars that uh, were sold, some of the BMWs that we talked about a couple weeks ago. Uh, the 2001 M Coupe sold for 52,000. The estimate was 50 to 70 thousand dollars. The 88 M6 sold for 60. A little underestimate. It was 70 to 90 thousand dollars. The 2002 M5 sold for 56 thousand dollars. The estimate was 50 to 70 k. The 1974 2002 Turbo. This was surprising. Sold for 100 thousand dollars, and the estimate was 150 to 175. So that was a pretty big miss there. The M Three, 1988, sold for 100 grand, just hitting bottom estimate. The 2001 M Roadster sold for 33 grand. This is another surprise. The low estimate was 45 to 55k. The 1995 M3 Lightweight, which we spent a lot of time on that a few episodes ago, sold for 115. The estimate was 150 to 180. The 2003 Z8 Alpina sold for 360, and the estimate was 450 to 500. And the 2011 M1. Uh, actually, probably sold the best compared to the estimate. Fifty-eight thousand dollars was the hammer price. The auction estimate was forty to sixty grand, so it hit closer to the high estimate. Now, one thing is, is if these cars are no reserve, the expectation is is that it will bring more because you have more people in the room bidding on this car, more eyes on the car. So typically, the estimate's a little higher than maybe what the market price is. So just because it missed the estimate doesn't mean it wasn't a market correct price. So hopefully, that makes sense. So now let's go to RM Sotheby's. So they only had four cars that were not sold, which was really amazing. And they achieved almost $36 million in sales, number one sales auction house for the weekend. Uh, so they had a really awesome time. Sale through rate was 94%, which was the highest of any of the three auction houses. The average year went down one year and went from 1966 to 1965. And there was a, a great sell through rate Friday night and Saturday. A couple, a couple points here. The Ferrari Enzo I mentioned earlier, uh, that sold for almost seven, or I'm sorry, almost two point eight million dollars. So that was really strong. It came from the Lingerfeld Felder collection out of Detroit, and then the next highest sale was a 1938 Bugatti Type 57. That one sold for one point, almost one point seven million. Or uh, the third highest seller was a 1963 Ferrari 250 GL. I'm sorry, GTL Aluso sold for one point six. And they had other couple cool cars. One that was really cool is an 87 Porsche 959 that was upgraded by Canapa. That sold for a little bit over a million dollars. They had a 2004 uh, Porsche Carrera GT. Sorry, that noise in the background is my cat trying to attack my fish in my fish tank. Uh, the Carrera GT sold for almost $800,000. Uh, had a couple four GTs that sold well. And a couple surprise cars here. There was a 1990 Mercedes-Benz 560 SEC AMG, that uh, 6.0 wide body. It nearly doubled its pre-sale estimate of $220,000 to 260. dollars It actually sold for almost $400,000. So that was 
shocking, eye-opening, and cool to see. And the one that I was in the room for, which was really cool, was the 1970 Lola T165 Can-Am. So this is a car that I thought a friend of mine would be interested in. So I texted him if he was interested, and he said, only if it sells cheap. And the estimate was, I believe, 200 to 225 Well, when this thing hit $400,000, there was a round of applause in the room, and it ended up hammering at $665,000. So it tripled expectations which was really amazing. So if you go back and you go online and watch the video, there's two phone bidders that just had to have this car. It was really exciting and fun to watch. Another one that blew it out of the water was a 1962 Fiat 60 Jolly. These are the ones that have the kind of wild colors. They have the wicker seats from the factory, a beach car, and usually they sell really well. I thought this one was estimated strong at 50 to 60 grand. Uh, I had a couple nicks and scratches on it. It wasn't a mint car. Well, it turned out selling for $151,000, which is really, really nuts. So just a long, great, wonderful day at the Ritz-Carlton. They had a lot of cool stuff in there as well. They had a silent auction going on. They had artists. They had Chopard with their watches, all sorts of cool stuff happening. That night, I was invited to go to a hangar party, which was pretty cool. It was a small hangar that uh, they had a private party, and it was a Porsche collector that had a lot of... uh, 993s, you know, different kinds of cars. Um, hey, kitty. That uh, that was really cool and some really great barbecue, so thanks for the invite there. Now, I will have to say, I did realize at this point that I did not have the right shoes for the weekend. I thought I did, so I found myself limping back to the car uh, numerous times over the weekend, so good shoes are paramount. Sunday was the Concourse de Elegance celebrating Roger Penske and all of his amazing cars. Now, this was so crazy. It was such a big collection. I am not a big race guy. Like, I watch NASCAR, I watch some of the, I watch some Formula One, but this was nuts. Like, there were so many cars that of his that he's raced in the past or his team's won. There was three separate classes, and each class had 20 or 30 cars, and they were iconic, amazing cars. I just, a couple off the top of my head are the uh, 917, Porsche that was raced, a Ferrari GTO that was from the Ralph Lauren collection because there was some connection there. There was one of the six Corvette Grand Sports, and that was just insane, the cars that were part of the Roger Penske collection. It's just incredible. So be sure to go back onto their website and check it out. So a lot of those cars were there. I met a lot of uh, the folks in the automotive world I've always wanted to meet. Met Donald Osborne, met Bruce Myers, McKeel Haggerty, Wayne Carini, nice guy. John Oates from Daryl Hall and John Oates was there. Ken Ingram, I'll see him next week, and he'll be a future guest. Ray Schaefer, a previous guest. Marvin Waters, also a previous guest from the Sand Hills Motoring Festival. And then Pierre Hadari, he was there checking out Mercedes. So thank you all for being previous guests, and it was great to catch up you catch up with each of you in person. While I was there, I was asked to film a little interview for the NSM Insurance Group, which includes... Hancock and American Collectors Insurance. So when that comes out, I will be sure to share it with everyone. I'll have it in my newsletter. So if you haven't signed up, just go to collectorcarpodcast.com and you will get it. Uh, The show field was unbelievable. A ton of Ferraris. There was quite a few of the Ferrari Testarossas from the 50s. Uh, There were two GTOs, which is really insane to see two of them. One of them, as I mentioned before, was Ralph Lauren's Um, The Best of Show Concourse Elegance Trophy was given to a 1929 Duesenberg limousine. And the winner of the Best in Show Concourse The Sport Trophy went to the Porsche 917 Can-Am Spider. That was part of the Penske display. Uh, So just an incredible, amazing show. I hadn't been in maybe eight years or so. It's expensive. I think the ticket was $150. And for kids, it was like $60, but it is well, well worth it. As I mentioned before, I had the wrong shoes on. So the end of Sunday, I found myself limping my way back to my car, which I couldn't find for a little while. So be sure you remember where you parked. (laughs) So this is my brief review of Amelia. There'll be more coming in the future. But as always, keep your tires straight, your foot on the gas, and remember to wear good shoes at Amelia next year. I'll talk to all of you next week. Thanks for listening to the Collector Car Podcast. Don't forget to give us a nice rating on iTunes and be sure to follow us on Instagram and everywhere else at the Collector Car Podcast.